Good morning, conference. A week ago at 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister announced the date of the most defining vote in a generation, June 23rd, the date when Britain decides if we want the cold comfort of isolation in an increasingly turbulent world, or if we want to work with our neighbours on our shared problems we face. The task ahead is not simple, especially for those of us unimpressed by Cameron's sideshow, aimed as it was specifically to lance the boil on the fest the, that has been festering on the face of the Conservative Party for years. And speaking of purple pimples, I see Nigel Farage is still on the scene. <laughs> Wasn't he supposed to stand down last year? Well, think of this conference. In just 16 weeks' time, we can vote to stay in Britain and kick, sorry, stay, keep Britain in the EU and kick Farage out of politics once and for all. <laughs> but as I think about our role in the referendum, I'm reminded that we do our best when we think big, when we allow the vision of a better future to drive us, not the fear of things getting worse. I'm reminded of a saying that drives me in everything I do. Another world is possible. I was just 15 short years ago at the World Fo Social Forum in Brazil for when people from every corner of our planet came together to say just that. They knew then, as we know now, that corporate power was wreaking havoc in our workplaces. Then gutting our they were gutting our public services. They knew then, as we do now, that our planet has enough resources for everyone, but only if those resources are shared equally. And they knew then, as we know even better now, that another world isn't just a possibility, it's a necessity. Britain is a turning point. In 16 weeks, we face the biggest choice we've had in my lifetime. And it comes down to this. Do we go it alone, or do we believe that another world is possible, and that by working with our neighbours, we can better face the challenges we have in the 21st century? But it's not fear that motivates me to campaign for Britain to stay in Europe. It is hope. At the end of last year, that hope was abundant. In the wake of a horrific attack on all of our liberty just weeks before, it took real bravery for thousands of campaigners and activists to gather in the shadow of the Arc de Triomphe and demand our governments fulfill their promises on climate change. Because those promises had been flowing from the mouths of ministers as fast as the ice caps had been melting. I'm not often one to agree with the Prime Minister, but I couldn't fault a word he said when he said, instead of, instead of making excuses for tomorrow to our children and to our grandchildren, we should take action against climate change today. But his words and the diplomatic triumph of those talks ring hollow if our government continues to slash and burn our climate change policies. Solar subsidies, cut. Onshore wind, cut. The green home scheme, cut. We know what climate failure looks like. It's people trapped in their homes by raising floodwaters. It's buckets and mops bailing out the contents of a river from your front room. It's your livelihood ruined, your life in tatters. But in the face of these cuts and amid the disasters we're seeing, something beautiful is growing. People aren't just hoping for another world, they're making it. From small scale solar projects to community owned wind turbines, people are coming together to show the government how it's done. And this week we've seen the bravery of people in that movement. The Heathrow, the Heathrow 13 faced down jail time, never faltering or failing, failing to put across the urgency of their courageous action.
And across the world, others are leading the way and shaming our governments in the process. Last year, Denmark produced almost half of its energy from wind power. Latvia smashed through its 2020 renewables targets and Germany's renewable sector made, contributed to half of its energy mix. Rules agreed at the EU level by the UK and other na nations have dragged each and every country on our continent, at times admittedly kicking and screaming, towards a more sustainable future. As much as our government right might resist, these rules, though not as strong as some of us might like, stop the British government from abandoning our climate change target targets and force our dirtiest power stations to close. Sh slowly but surely, and in the face of resistance from the fossil fuel firms, change is happening. Sure, the outcomes of Paris does not deliver a safe climate, but if you listen to representatives from the small island states, and some of the poorest countries with the most to lose from climate change, they will tell you that working with the EU was key to getting the crucial 1.5 degree climate goal into the final agreement. Change like this comes from years of struggle, public outcry, and challenging those who hold power. And when it happens, it gives me real hope of what we can achieve. Hope is, of course, sometimes hard to find when faced with the big questions. It's all too easy to avoid confronting the scale of the challenges we face. There's no bigger question hanging over us all as a country, as a continent, as members of the human race, than how we deal with the refugee crisis on our shores. Doing nothing is not an option. Hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom are escaping war and terror, are forced into crowded boats by smugglers and sent into the water with little regard. They risk their lives in the process. And many, many don't make it. Surely there's no better illustration for the need for us to reimagine the world around us, or to work together with our neighbours to turn Fortress Europe into a welcoming home for those seeking safety. Because people's humanity is not lacking. Thousands of homes across the continent have been opened up to new arrivals, offering refuge in a time of need. But our governments have failed us. Britain has tried to go it alone, to deal with a crisis that does not respect national borders. Fortress Europe has prioritized keeping people out over saving children from the seas. Since the start of the crisis, Greens have been standing up for refugees, and as we call for a fair settlement, which ensures that each and every country takes its fair share for refugees, the need to work together across borders has never been more urgent. Another way of doing things is needed now, and it's down to all of us to make this happen. I don't know about you, conference. I, the honest truth is that sometimes I feel overwhelmed by the challenges that we face, uh, from climate change, to the suffering of refugees, to the pers per persistent and pernicious poverty in our own country. It can all sometimes seem insurmountable. And there is nothing more effective in compounding that sense of hopelessness than being isolated, which is why I take such inspiration from what's happening in Europe at the moment. From the uprising of Podemos in Spain to the fortitude of the Greek people in the face of the ECB and the IMF, to the unity shown across the continent after the Paris attacks, people are working together to make things better. I wasn't born when we last had the vote on EU membership, and I'm glad that we're finally be given the choice again, because the referendum, referendum has given us a chance to talk openly about the EU, where it works, where it doesn't, and the kind of EU that we want to see. And of course, the what's the green view on, on Europe will be one of the questions that voters will want to know in the run-up to the local and Welsh Assembly elections. This May, 
we'll have the chance to make history by getting our first Greens elected into the Welsh Assembly. We'll be standing for public services, real action on climate change, and a transport system that actually connects up Wales. And on every doorstep, we'll be making the case for a better Wales in a better Europe. But conference, to make a better Europe, we as Greens can't just talk the good talk, we need to put our words into action. And just weeks ago in Berlin, Caroline joined with campaigners, activists, academics and politicians from every corner of the continent to begin working towards a cross-border project to democratise the EU and to make it work for citizens of Europe rather than the corporations. And we were lucky to have three MEPs in Brussels who are making it their mission to make Europe better, from defending migrants' rights to keeping a close eye on the City of London, to ensuring that animals across the continent are given the best protection possible. Jean, Molly and Keith, you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. <laughs> this way of doing politics, of collaborating across continents, of fighting for a fairer society and working for radical change has been what the Green Party has always stood for. And we've always believed that when we work together, our combined efforts are greater than the sum of our parts. We know that these four nations have horizons which are broader than the confines of our shores. Another world is possible, but the future is owned by no one. Right now, the whole world will be watching Britain, wondering if we'll turn our backs and walk away, or stand with friends across Europe to fight for a better world. As Greens, we can build a better world, a better Europe, and a better Britain. So let's do that this May, do it again in June, because united, we stand for a social Europe, a sustainable Europe. Through the Greens, finally people have a chance to say this, Another Europe really is possible. Thank you very much.